coming to you from sunny Orlando, Florida. Welcome to the Paper Stack Podcast, where we cover current topics in the note industry, give you tactics for your note business, and talk with industry leaders to make you a better note investor. And now, your hosts, Brett Berkey and Rick Allen. Coming to you from our brand new studio. First ever recording in here. Actually, we haven't even done, we didn't do a sound check as far as checking a test recording of sound, but we'll see. We'll let her rip. You know what? Considering our last one was at the pool with kids screaming, this is going to look unbelievable. Movie That's, movie quality. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, we have to thank Mike, the developer, that put all this together. I helped him. Yes. Yeah, I right. was in here putting this up. You and I don't know what you were doing. You were running around. So Mike and I helped put this up. Yeah. But Mike, honestly, was the, the mastermind. The mastermind as far as coming together with what we needed to do all this and it makes sense because he has a film background yeah (laughs) motion graphics so yeah but we're still recording it from a phone i get it we got this all this stuff and we got a phone to record it but 4k 4k you're saying all this stuff they're looking around going all i see is blue background and you two knuckleheads so yeah that's true and plus this is on a podcast you guys are probably like what the hell are they talking about but it looks nice see it on youtube it's great it does see it does look good so today's episode so this is going to be me interviewing Rick, talking about some of his best deals and the three lessons he's learned from them. So we are going to start with his best wholesale deal, then we're going to move into his fix and flip deal, and then after that, his best note deal he's ever done. And I said, let's just jump into it. So Rick, I know you've been in this for over 15 years and mm. started in wholesaling. I did. Oh, started in wholesaling back in 2005 was where I cut my teeth with- Right uh, when all that stuff was going on, huh? That's when there, things were blowing, blowing up. up. Mm-hmm. Amazing. It was a, really a fortunate situation. It was a nationwide company called RealNet. They had offices all over the country and they also had their own hard money in-house. So right. I was able to get dip my toes into the debt space along with learning about distressed assets and evaluating houses, really. Nice. Before that, you were- Selling timeshare. Yeah. I was. I, I, so you, you learned sales and then you went into real estate, which was great. It was. I say timeshare. This was 2004 is when I did timeshare. I did it for a year, eight months, nine months. You can, timeshare, you can make some money, but you really, you learn the sales process. They're the Marines of time of sales. Yeah. Everybody walks in to buy timeshare. And it's funny, we used to do something called breaking the pack, but they walk in and they say, no matter what, we're not buying it. They make that pact mm-hmm. when they're out in the, it's sitting in the car waiting to come in for their tour. We're just and, here for the free tickets to Disney. Yeah, exactly. And everybody says that. So you really have to learn how to do a lot of the technical stuff of boxing and closing and trial closing and asking the right questions. But then you also learn how to connect with people because people and how to start connecting emotionally because that's what sells. That was, yeah, that was really fortunate, but started doing timeshare and then about 10 months in, my my dad's hey there's an opportunity with my secretary's kid at this place real net and so i went and applied i remember he didn't give me the job right away and so i it was the first time i'd ever not gotten a job when i walked in the front door and so he's like, yeah i got to interview some other people just check with me and i just called him every single day say hey just wanted to call and check in to see how things are going how's your interviewing going seeing where you are in the process anything i can do anything else i can get you And finally, after about five days of calling, he said, you have the job. Just stop calling me. Come in. Report this day for work. I've never had anybody call me that much. You're going to do well at this. Persistence, man. It was. Persistence. It was. So my first wholesale or my best wholesale deal where you just either knocked that apart financially or just one of those ones that just amazing, just just a learning Man, there's so many. And there was in really it's there's so many. How many? 400? Yeah, over 400. So there's so many at different times. There's always the one that like I was a part of as an owner that I didn't do anything on. That was always a really cool one because it was like, man, I just made money and I had salespeople and acquisitions guys and doing that. And that was pretty cool for us as an owner. The first paycheck we got when we started our own company was cool, but probably the best. There's two that come to mind. One was a, it was, there was, um, is when I worked at RealNet, I was Mm -hmm. a sales guy. So there was a hundred thousand dollar wholesale fee. Oh, dang. A $100,000 wholesale fee. And if a high dollar fee or call it whatever you want, assignment fee hit the board, the sales board, the sales guys were like automatically on it. And I actually got accused of only selling the high fees. They're like, you only sell the ones that are 
ten thousand or higher. I'm like, yeah, yeah, d- yeah I'll work harder, not smart, or work smarter, not harder. Right. So this one hit the board. It was a hundred thousand dollar fee, and it hit late in the day. And I had a guy go. I know this guy will buy it. I called him up, and he was like, "I'm in Denver right now. I need to see the house." Like I go, "Okay, there's a lot of people interested in this. Let me know." So I scanned and emailed him the packet. He was away on business, and he ended up calling me that night at 10:30. Oh, wow. Okay. And he's saying, "Hey, I like this. If you can get me pictures, I'll see." And that it was a there was a deal was in Deltona. So I, I was like, "Absolutely." So. <laughs> I jumped out of bed, I put my clothes on, and I drove to Deltona at 10.30 at night. night. Yeah. And I started shooting pictures of the house. And he goes, I need to see pictures of the house to the right and to the left. You were doing this live. Huh? Yeah, you're, yeah. You're doing this and sending him a text message here at 10.30 uh, at night? No, no I, I, uh, I don't think we had, no, we didn't have. Dropbox? We didn't have those then. We didn't have cameras. Oh, we had the, on the, phone. the razors and the flip phones? Yeah. And, my next cell? And so, no, I took pictures. I remember taking pictures with a digital camera, going home, uploading on my computer, and emailing it to him. Oh, wow. And then him calling me or t- sending me an email that it's night like going. up and down in the snow. Yeah, I know, I know. Nowadays. And then him sending me an email that night saying, I'll take it. Oh, wow. So I put together, and I did all this way after hours. And that way, when people came in the next day, it was sold. Holy crap. And so that was a pretty good one. So you made $100,000 on that? No, we only got paid 10% as a sales guy. So I made 10 grand, which was worth 10 grand to me for sure. It was a good deal. Yeah. But I think the best one was whenever. Are you new to the mortgage note industry? Have you been wanting to learn the step-by-step process to purchase your first mortgage note? Well, you're in luck. We've convinced our CEO, Rick Allen, to break down everything he knows about mortgage note investing. Through a series of 50 videos, you'll get everything from start to finish of where to purchase notes, how to purchase notes, and all of Rick's investing techniques he has developed over the many years. From performing note tactics to non-performing notes, Rick gives you everything he knows about investing. Bonuses include our glossary of industry terms, Rick's own proprietary calculators he created to evaluate notes, discounts from our partners, our Rolodex of vendors, a private Facebook group, along with a lot more. We've packed so much content into the Academy to take you from beginner to expert in no time. To learn more about the Academy, go to academy.paperstack.com slash welcome. Again, that is academy.paperstack.com slash welcome. So RealNet in 2008, TJ and myself and two other guys left in January because the market was starting to get real shaky in 08. Yeah. Things were getting questionable. And I think the catalyst for us leaving was the, the hard money stop. Yeah. So they were like yeah. all the hard money loans I had. And I was king of selling hard money loans. I would, I would get people in. The first thing they sit down, I'd say, let's go get you. It's like a blank Pro- check. Mm-hmm. Let's get you approved and see what you can buy. Mm-hmm. And so my loans, they started like I was having to fight for everyone to get approved. I'm like, they've done... X amount of deals, what's going on. And then they're like, all right, hard money shut down for a bit. And we're like, and then we were having a, having it out with our boss at the time. He was, he would ride our ass pretty hard, get us to do stuff. And so we ended up just leaving and going, doing our own thing. And we started our company, Investment Homes Direct. Fast forward to whenever TJ and I sold Investment Homes Direct after 400 wholesale deals. And this was at the end of 2011. I had a bank agent call me, an REO agent, and he was like, hey, I bought, I, I must have done 25 houses with this guy. He would sell me. Mm-hmm. And he's, hey, I have a, I got a listing if you're interested in it. And so he, I was like, yeah, I'll take a look at it. And it was in Chandula. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah. And so. Chandula is a really nice neighborhood. Oh, it's there. a super nice neighborhood in the mirror. What was the guy? Dang. It, it was, he used to be super famous guy that lived back in there. Huge house. I don't know. Forget Anyways, it was, it was a, probably a six or 7,000 square foot house. Jeez. It was a nice house that it was like I was getting it for five, 550, I think, which was just a steal. The house next door was selling for 2.1 million. Wow. So it was just like, it was an unrealistic. Why? What was it doing? It was just a foreclosure and it was right in, it was right at the end of 11 when it was like there was still this mass glut of foreclosures. And I fortunately had this agent working for me at the time. He was working the deal. He got to keep both sides of the commission. So he was motivated to make sure I got the deal. And I did. 
in that wholesale deal, we wound up finding a, actually the guy who worked for me wound up finding this borrower or this buyer who I, we took over and just started talking to her. And she was like, look, she was like, I'm going to finance it. And at the time, like, you can't finance an assignment fee of 60000 She's like, trust me, my bank will do it. And it was a small regional bank. And she owned eight 7-Elevens or something. When you have that sort of relationship with your banker, they'll do pretty much whatever you ask. She was like, you just assign me the contract and I'll give you a check for $60,000. And so she, that's what she did. She came in and I remember her giving TJ and I this cashier's check for $60,000. I still have the picture of it today. We're like holding it up at the bank. Like, we take a picture of us? Because it was our, we had just left again, sold off a company and we're starting another company. And we're like, need some operating cash. Mm -hmm. Boom, done, 60 grand. Wow. So that was probably, like I said, it's all time, timing. There's certain things that are timing. It's what most important. The first time when we left RealNet and we started our own company, the first check that I got was $800. It was small, but I still have that check because I was like, that was super important. It was like, that's the first one. We did it. We're, we were cash flow, not cash flow positive, but we're making money. Was, yeah, it was crazy. We started Investment Homes Direct with 10 grand. Really? Yeah. And you built up to how many employees? We had, we probably had close to 20 between, maybe more than that, between Florida. We had two offices or between Orlando and St. Pete. Why St. Pete? St. Pete, we were, obviously Tampa was good. Yeah. St. Pete was awesome. And at the time, I wish I would have had unlimited capital at the time because the houses, you could pick up a house on the canal out to the bay for 140 Holy crap. Yeah. And those things are 500 right now. And it's just one of those things where it was just a phenomenal area, phenomenal time. So it was just a little frame, or not frame, little block ranch Florida cracker houses that you could just kill it on. So we just chose St. Pete because it was... It's a straight line across from Orlando, and it was we wanted to spread our wings, and we're like, let's open an office over there. Let's have boots on the ground. Wow, yeah, and that was Investment Homes Direct. Investment Homes Direct, yeah. So. so a funny story is that at this time I was working for an agency, and I did a lot of agency work. And Rick called me. I ran into. I don't know how the hell I ran into you. I don't know either. Eh, we're still recording, so uh, you're fine. Yeah, somehow I ran into Rick. And he's like, hey, come down, to the, come down to my office. I want to see if you can give me a quote for designing our new website. And I was like, okay. So I'll go down there and do it. It's like, honestly, it was like a, like a frat house. You guys had like liquor bottles and stuff. And you guys were just, a, it was all young dudes running around. That's, yeah, that was our, that was the, A, the allure of working in that industry. And that's who you drew. Like people who were in the restaurant business yeah. tended to thrive wholesaling yep. houses. Yep. And this was wholesaling houses today is so much different than it was at that time in 2008, 10, 11, 12. It's just a different ball game. First of all, it's really hard right now to wholesale a house because everybody has access to Zillow. Yeah. You really have to be honed in on today on taking advantage of distressed situations. Where back then you didn't need to take care of the distressed situation we were taking advantage of was foreclosures. foreclosures. Matter of fact, I was talking to somebody across the office here about us and he mm -hmm. was like, bumped into a, an old funding partner yeah. and he was like, hey, I heard you guys had a pretty prominent wholesale. So I was like, yeah, we, we did some deals. And I was telling him that we were wholesaling houses off of MLS. Yeah, I remember you And that. his head was just like, you guys used to do that? It's like, yeah, that was, yeah, we would do that. It was actually even when some of my best deals off MLS were not, all the, my best deals were not bank owned houses minus that $60,000 one. But the consistent ones were the ones that were, were probate. Oh, oh man, yeah. or land or something was held in a life estate. And I would actually search for life estate stuff because it was like, if I can find something in a life estate, I wanted to take advantage of that. I was like, let's do that because these people probably inherited the house. They don't know what to do with it. Maybe they're behind on their taxes. Is that still possible today? Yeah, you could still do it. And if you were going to do it, I always liked it's a double edged sword, you know. What's a blessing is a curse. What's a curse is a blessing. By the way, if you've never watched the Garth Brooks documentary on Netflix, I recommend it. I watched that last night and he did that. But it was, it was really good, really interesting. But anyways, yeah, I would always look for the, the probate deals where there was multiple yeah. people in there. I didn't want just one person or two people. If I could get five, six, seven people, sometimes it was difficult to get them all on board to sell. But if they were all on board to sell, then you could actually get a bigger discount with some more people because they were having to take less of a haircut. So I would routinely go in and like, I remember there was one over by Lake Highland Prep in a real nice area over by Mills 
area here, it's a real upcoming area or was at least at the time. Now it's just exploded. But getting houses that were listed at 300,000 that were in shambles that I would just get them for 200,000 or 180. Damn. Yeah. And that's just because there were so many errors on the estate that it was like so easy to just to like, look, instead of making 30 grand, you're going to make 25 grand. But that's not a big difference. You're like, oh, $5,000 less. Who cares? Yeah. Now, if that's two people and yeah. I said, you're each going to make 150 or you're going to make 100. That's a huge difference. $50,000. They're like, whoa. Yeah. So it's easier if you're going to go after the probate stuff to find the ones that have, it's not always, but it, most of the time it works out. The story I would have wanted to push the thing that was pretty neat. So at that time when they were doing Investment Homes Direct, I came with my partner to quote them on a website. But we had overhead of employees. We had, I don't know, six or something like that. So we had all these different employees. And uh, we, we were quote, expensive. We were expensive. I think we quoted you like 5,000 bucks or something. To, Which to, is not much. Yeah, yeah. But at the time, it was like, yeah, we can do all this for 5,000. And it was funny, like years later, I'm sitting with Mike, the developer, who did all this here. And we were talking and somehow he said, yeah, no, I actually was bidding against somebody to make the Investment Homes Direct website. I was like, wait a second, I lost the contract to you? Yeah. He's like, yeah, I actually did the site. I was like, no freaking way. Yeah, so small world. it is funny. Yeah. I always tapped my circle of influence, yeah, like yeah. the people that I knew. It yeah. was like, yeah, I'll talk to, I knew Mike, like yeah. whenever we started this. And I go, I've got, whenever we got the stuff back, when we started Paper Stack, it was investment notes. Investment note exchange. Investment note exchange, right? Yeah. And so we outsourced it and I'm sure you've heard the story, but what we got back was just, oof. It was bad. And so I said, I know who we're going to use. Yeah. I got the guy. Yeah. And I, I remember got... looking at the code and going, what year did, was this made? And this is like, what, 2009 or something? I was like, this is some high-tech stuff for 2009. He was using jQuery and all these things at that time. I was like, this was cutting edge in 2009. Yeah. I was like, yeah, this is going to be a good guy. Yeah, it was good. So back to the story. So your best fix and flip. Do you have, a, do you have one that you can think of? Yeah. It was a note that actually turned into a fix and flip. Oh, that's and interesting. Okay. Yeah. So- it was over on the east side of Orlando, and it was, it's my favorite fix and flip because it was paint and carpet. And oh, nice. we yeah. ended up getting, getting the house. We're going through the process. We bought the note, and this, it turns out that the, the people were divorced. Okay. And so they're like, oh my gosh, they're divorced. Good luck on getting them to all agree. So we, were, we did four or five drive-bys on the house, and finally we got the lady there. And we started talking to her. She you need to talk to my attorney. And it was this guy, Mario Tolisani. He's out of New York. And it was a nightmare. Mm. Like, it was like playing phone tag with him. And he was like, Rick, I'm waiting on you to get this deal done. Rick, what's going on? And I'm like, dude, I've left you 20 messages. Let's mm. do it. So we finally get, get a deed in lieu of foreclosure. Mm. And we're into this thing. We paid the lady. Then we paid the lady like five grand. And so we're into this thing for around a hundred. We put five grand more into it. We're into it for one oh five and we sold it for two fifteen. Wow. And like it sold in eight days or something. It was just ridiculous. And this was uh, this was such a cool time. That was like twenty twelve, twenty thirteen. Nobody was in notes. Oh there's people in notes, but it wasn't people are in notes, but so in our circle. When we bought our first note transaction, which that would probably be my favorite because that's what got me into it. We did the deal, the frame duplex, 90 grand. We paid 8,400 bucks for it. In and out, sold it for 38. And we started, we we're like, that was awesome. Let's, so we started talking, like, is anybody else doing this? Let's check it out. So we would call TJ and I'd been wholesaling or in the real estate, local real estate market at that point by for eight years. So we were like, we knew we had a pretty good Rolodex going. Nobody. Called everybody. People were like, nah, never heard of notes. Oh, I heard of it. Nah, not doing anything with it. I don't know. No, don't know anything about it. We're just going to stay with wholesaling houses. And he and I, that's when we were like, we're doing a full on pivot. We are pivoting out of houses and we're focusing solely on notes because there's A, there's no competition here, which is always key. Yeah, that's when I would, yeah, blue ocean strategy. Yeah, that's what I did in wholesale. Wholesaling, I didn't know what I was doing. To me, it always just made more sense. I was like, if everybody is offering on REO, and foreclosures, I'm going to go offer and start focusing on divorce, probate, doing all that stuff. And I would just always, it just makes more sense to me to go away from everybody else. You Let me do my own thing. It's all the fork in the road and went straight, huh? Yeah. Oh, the, like, I didn't even know it was called a blue ocean strategy. Yeah, Certainly ocean. at the time, I didn't know. Oh, yeah. yeah um, no, I just thought it was like, a, to me, it seems smarter is to go where yeah. your competition's not. Yeah. So what are some takeaways from that, from the fix and flip? Something like, like a, 
someone that's getting into notes, maybe it's on paper stack or something, if they were to evaluate a note and they saw the situation, what? That one, you driving by, I knew it was going to be a fairly clean house. You can look at the outside, look at the inside, or look, you couldn't look at the inside, but you could look at the outside and say, okay, it's not too much of a wreck. I knew it was built in 03, 04, maybe. So it wasn't like it was terribly old. Yeah, yeah. I knew I wasn't going to do a lot of major stuff, too, at least I didn't think so. I think you learn more from the your failures, right? Yeah. So from that, I would say, like, always plan for the worst. Yeah. On that one, it was not really an issue, but there's some other ones where you need to figure out your offer price and stick to it and plan on, look, I'm going to have to take this thing back and there's probably going to be 30 grand in rehab and let that dictate your price because sometimes you can get, okay, I need to deploy this money. I need to get it out there earning. But if you put it into something where it's like you could wind up in trouble, yeah. if you put it in, okay, I'm going to get this house. I'm going to put it in there to where somebody is going to make it reperforming. It doesn't always happen. And you have to be ready. You have to be prepared for the worst. So that's, that would be my biggest takeaway is look at it from every different angle that and check the taxes. Taxes will get you, especially yeah. in Illinois. Tell me if I'm a novice on some of that stuff, but isn't it true that you can check the taxes and if someone's been like, someone's bought the tax deed, they he, can be paying it and you have no idea. So you have to do, you have to pull like a real on title report. Like they'll actually, you know what? Dickie Baldwin has a new type of report for 40 bucks that will do that. <laughs> he was telling me about it. So Dickie, if you hear this, we'll put a link to you in the bottom, but definitely it was some, Baldwin advisory group. Yeah. He was talking about that, uh, that it's just some new report. It's like, a, it was stupid cheap. It was like 30 or 40 bucks. I'm like, that makes sense. Cause you check the taxes and you're like, oh, it all looks good. And then you find out that a tax lien guy has been buying these things and hold them paying the taxes and there's waiting for you to show up to buy a note. And then. Yeah. What'll happen is that's a strategy that they can use is if, so if I bought taxes that were like a tax lien, mm -hmm. right? So in Florida, the way it works is you have a tax lien. You get the tax lien, and then you apply for the tax deed. If you end up getting a tax deed on the property, that wipes out the first position mortgage. It, like, trumps it. Yeah. So what you could do is, like, a strategy is you buy the tax lien, and then you go ahead and you pay the taxes moving forward. It always appears mm -hmm. like it's, it's performing. Performing. Mm -hmm. The taxes are being paid, and then you apply for your tax deed. And there's supposed to be notification that like, look, you're supposed to be notified that the taxes are being sold or that, that there's a tax deed application in place. So you, there is time. But a lot of times these notes, how many times have we, how long are the assignment chains? Oh, yeah. Crazy. So they might be sending it to the wrong. Could be. Yeah. And they're not, it's not like they're going to reverse it. It's, t I've seen a lot of people, I've heard of people, not seen it, I've heard of people getting screwed. And it's just, then there's places like Alabama where there's like an unlimited redemption period or something. <laughs> like that. There's a story of my buddy told me that uh, he was trying to get me to figure this out for him because he, he knew we were in real estate and doing all this with paper mm -hmm. stuff. He said, you need to start looking on tax lane stuff. I was like, that's a whole different ball of wax, man. He's like, just to let you know, my buddy bought a horse farm in Ocala. Yeah, you were telling me about that. Like $30,000 or something, something stupid. Just paid the back taxes. But the horse farm itself was worth like nine sixty. And I was like, why the hell would they let it go? He's like, the horses are worth more than that. The whole place. These guys were from out in the UAE or something like that. Ocala is like one of the best places in the nation to have horses. Because of the soil. Because of the soil and the, 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 yeah, I think it's the soil. It's the soil. There's something there in the soil that when they eat the grass, it makes their bones real strong or something like something that. Something like that. And so the guy just, he just was like, this was around when the downturn came last time. And uh, he just walked away. And he just went back to his country and said, I don't care. Let it go. And then someone came in and scooped it up and got him a $960,000 place for like 30000 Just had to pay the taxes. That's insane, right? That's the kind of, that's the kind of thing. Like he ever, everyone's got the, like I have the one. That's that, the grand slam right there. The grand slam. I had the one that got away. The, oh, the school? Oh, the school. Yeah. That one is. That sucks. Yeah. It sucks. It was such a learning experience. I had an opportunity. This was circa 2000 and probably 10, maybe beginning of 11. So we were knee deep in, in the financial the downturn. Real estate was in the crapper. And I remember that's the first time I actually heard about notes. I remember where I heard, I don't remember where I heard about notes or whatever, but it was like, yeah, I'll take, I'm interested. Again, I, my dad's an attorney. So I was like, hey, do you know any small banks? He's like, actually, we represent one. And I was like, okay, I'll reach out to him. So I reached out to him and said, hey, do you have any, uh, any distressed notes or non-performing loans that you wanted to sell? And this guy's like, actually, I do have one. It's a piece of commercial property. 
It's at the corner of, was that 535 and Apopkab Island? And Apopkab Island. Mm -hmm. Is that what it is? Where the uh, school is. There's a high school there now. This is the Windermere High School. Okay. So, yeah, it's at, that, it's at this corner. It's in Windermere, which is a real nice area of town here in Orlando, like a suburb. A lot of athletes live there, professional athletes. So, we ended up looking at it, and I think that it was, they owed $3 million. And we offered them um, 600000 and they said, yeah, we'll take it. And they go, okay, I don't have $600,000 to throw at this. What do I do? And so I was like, okay, I'm going to show this to somebody who I ended, who we had done some business with in the past, but they wound up eventually cutting us out of the deals that we set up. Like they, we were, they were funding the deals. We would go ahead, use our crew to get it rehabbed, these houses and set up. And eventually they just took our rehab crew and we were, yeah. So it was like, ah, I got a bad taste in my mouth. I should have got, knowing now, I would say, I'll, I'll just paper myself up, put contracts, non-competes, all that stuff in place before I show it to him. And, but he said, yeah, I'll do the deal for you. But I was afraid to pull the trigger because I was like, he's going to cut me out again. And so I never pulled the trigger. And it's- What did it sell for? Millions, four million. The school board bought it. So when it went through foreclosure auction, they took it back. And I think the, the school board wound up buying it, or Orange County, and putting up Windermere High School. And this, so it was like, see, that's, see, that's just fake. Cause if you would have got that deal, you would have never started paper stack. No, no, I don't know what happened. <laughs> You'd have been like, I'm done. No, it would have been, it would have been just different. Who knows if I got the deal, we may have developed the land ourselves. So you just, yeah. you don't really know, but it's one of those things where I, after that time, I was like, I'll never not take a shot on goal mm -hmm. because I missed that shot. And the only reason I missed it is because I didn't take it because I can look at it now, hindsight 2020, of course, but say that was a slam dunk. That was a two comma mistake, I call it a two comma mistake. The caveat also too is that school was built like maybe ten years later too. So you would have had to hold that land probably. Because you said two thousand and eight, it just went up in two thousand. Uh, no, it was two thousand and it was probably eleven. Two thousand ten, two thousand eleven. That school went up in seventeen or seventeen or eighteen. Sixteen. Did it really? Yeah, I think it went up in sixteen. Oh, okay. And they bought it like and they, oh, they, they had to buy it. They had to buy it a couple years prior to that. So you so might want to hold it for two years. A couple years, but yeah. that couple years is it didn't. They didn't buy it much after the people took possession oh, of it. Okay. So it was one of those things where there's probably another couple hundred grand in legal fees. So you're in it for eight hundred. Still, that's just a, yeah. And so, what about your best note deal? My best note deal, contract for deed note deal. Oh, yeah, tell us that one. That one's fun. Actually, I bought it. I bought the deal off Paper Stack. It sat on Paper Stack for, it sat on there for a month and nobody was bidding on it. And the unpaid principal balance was like 35. The total due was like 40 or 42 or something like that. So, like, you know what? I'm going to take a look at this. And the house was worth, I comped it out, as is was worth 120 maybe. Fixed up, I was like 180. I don't know. It was 180 fixed up for sure. I was guessing 120, but it was like they were selling it for 35,000. They were selling it for what the principal balance was. And I was like, shit, what's the deal? So I reached out to the guy selling it. I was like, hey, what's going on with this? Why aren't you foreclosing? Or he was like, the seller's gone dark or the borrower's gone dark. They won't talk to us. So I was like, all right, can I see the, the servicing notes? And unfortunately, it was being serviced by SN. And so I saw the servicing notes. I confirmed it. I was like, the lady said she would sign the house over. I was like, what's going on here? So I was like, all right, you take a discount. He's like, no, I need 35 for it. I'm like, that's what the UPB is. If you don't know, the most you can claim whenever you go to foreclose is basically what they owe you. You can't, you, you can't try to get more out of it. You can't take it for the value. No. The most you can bid. So... If I buy this at 35 and they owe 40 plus some legal fees or bass due taxes, maybe I'm at 45 and I'll probably be into it for 40. So I'm like, worst case, I'm going to make 10% on my money. And it was a non, I think it was a non-judicial state. So I was like, but the best case, if I can get this borrower back on the line to sign it over, she'll sign the house over. And so I was like, yeah, we'll take it. I said, I'll roll the dice. And we wound up, you know how I got in touch with her? Yeah. Text. Yep. Yeah, man. Texas magical. I called, no answer. Servicer called, no answer. Finally, I shot her a text message. I said, Hey, are you interested in signing this over? I just bought this loan. Got her on the phone. She confirmed who I was. She's like, Okay. I go, Why did you stop dealing? Why'd you stop? Why'd you shut down? She said, I didn't like the attorney. 
the attorney they were using was a, an a-hole. And I'm like, so you just stopped? She's like, yeah, I just stopped answering the phone. I didn't want to deal with that guy. He was a jerk. I'm like, can I pay you three grand for your thing? She's like, yeah, I would have done it for nothing. But yeah, three grand. Gave her three grand. We turn around found an agent, listed it. Even the agents were like, who are you? They they couldn't understand how we got the house. They thought we were scamming. I'm like, we're not scamming. We just got the house back via Dean and Lou. And we wound up selling it for 95. Wow. Yeah. So How long did that take? Front to back, it was like 60 days. Wow. So 35 to 90. Yeah, 60 days. It was good. It was awesome. And they bought the note off paper stack. So there you go. There's deals on there. You just got to be creative, right? I think, yeah, I think that's it. And it was one of those things where like I I sat and looked at that deal and I go, well, I don't know why nobody's buying this. So what's the lesson from that? Like that just be like attention to detail, I think. I think it's attention to detail and it's seeing like, it's understanding the note business. I think if you understand the note business and you can understand that there's going to be multiple ways to skin a cat you can say and you can be happy with a base hit that's the thing is that was i was content with a 10 percent return knowing that it would be a six month 10 percent return so if i did that annual that's a 20 percent annualized yeah so i can redo it but i knew the potential for the upside was big it was just huge and then also looking at the servicing notes i was able to see through the servicing notes that hey these people at one point in time they they said that they would sign the house over. Something turned them off. And so that's, if you see those things, those are just like, those are, in my opinion, little indicators that are no-brainers. Like, Let's get in there and give it a try. So how long did it take you to look through all the servicing notes, stuff like that? Oh, that was like three minutes, four minutes, five minutes. Oh, wow. I'm just imagining you flipping through pages and pages. No, there's, it comes over on a, either a printout and worst case, there's like 10 pages, but I wasn't necessarily going through there trying to read every nook, cranny, and detail. I was looking for stuff that pertained to that point. So I'm sitting there flipping through, looking for a certain keywords. I find it, and then I start reading. Like, I don't need to know every time that – I don't care about every time they're paying force place insurance or anything like that. I just want to see what's the meat, and then I want to look and see what happened when they went radio silent, where they went dark. Interesting. Yeah, that's what you want to go in there and figure all that stuff out because that – you circle that, and you say, okay, this was on track, and it went off the tracks here. How can I go fix the track, put it back on? I take over now and do that. And so we used to do that when we would buy stuff from Condor Capital. You could go look and you could see, and they never, they didn't have necessarily the best reputation about, they would hammer their borrowers a little bit, so to speak. I don't know. I didn't work there. So this is hearsay, but I knew that if I got their deals, it was always just about, which is how it's just our philosophy with the fund is just treat people like people, right? You can, if you treat people like people, your goal is to get in there and have a, like a win situation, something that's going to work for everybody and yeah. let it be their idea. You know, that makes, I, that's, uh, that makes total sense. It's kind of like your welcome video, right? That you guys, did you guys ever launch that? Which one? Or you got, they're sitting on the couch and say, hey, we just bought your loan. We just want to let you know we're real people. You can reach out to us. Text oh, us. yeah, we did do that. I don't know if we've actually sent that out or not, but that's a good idea. I forgot we have that in our arsenal. But yeah, yeah. that's yeah. something. <laughs> we still have that. I, I, I actually have it right on the computer. But that's, they shot a video telling the people, look, don't if you, if something comes up, just let, be honest let us with know. us. We're real people. We're here we're to help. help. Yeah, yeah. And that's it's, it. And, it, and it, the people you got a Christmas card one year, didn't you? From a bar. Borrower sent us a Christmas card because we saved their house, and that's it. If you work on work with people, it's amazing what happens. That's awesome. Yep. So, all right, this is episode seven, and uh, coming out with some more. We're gonna do some shorter ones. We're just gonna be like a ask stuff about paper stacks. So, if you have questions about anything on how things work, or if you have a question specifically mm. for Rick about note investing, yep. He can answer it. I can't. If it's something about paper stack and how to do something on paper stack, Mike could probably answer it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll be coming out with some YouTube videos that are a little bit Shorter. short. They're short stuff just to say, look, here's some kind of like the pro tips, the pro hacks. Here's how you do some things. Brett just did a great one with a lot of people have NDAs on the platform right now. They're like, I need to have an NDA signed. Just go ahead, drop it right into your files. Whenever somebody reaches out to you and says, here, I'd like to see this. They've already got the NDA. Say, go ahead. Download it in the files, sign it, send it back. We're good to go. Move forward. You get it from somebody one time, you only got to get it one time. True. That's it. If you have any questions, hashtag ask paper stack and uh, subscribe, like, all that fun stuff. You know, mm -hmm. Smash the button. That's what my kids' YouTube channel says right, or whatever. Smash, the button. smash that like button. All right. Have a great weekend. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, guys. Thanks.